call this meeting Tuesday, 6th of February, Planning and Zoning Board of the City of Melford to order. I'd like to have everyone stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, we'd love a roll call from left to right. Good evening and thank you for coming. I'm Brian Collegian. Nancy Austin. John Grant. Carl S. Moore. Scott Marlowe. Tom Panzala. Denise Doucette, Denise. C. Robert Setti, Jr. And I'm Jim Quish, uh, board chair. We have uh, David Solskis. Uh, staff with us. Um, our first order of business is um, a meeting calendar revision. Um, David, if you would speak to that. Yeah, um, we are required every year um, to post with the city clerk uh, all of your meetings ahead of time. So we do our best when we put that calendar together. And uh, we realized uh, after we submitted it to you for approval and sent it to the city clerk, uh, that uh, Wednesday we had in it uh, Tuesday, uh, November uh, 6th, which was uh, uh, election day. And we traditionally never hold uh, a meeting on election night. Um, so uh, we're asking uh, for you to approve uh, the change to Wednesday, November 7th, so we can provide that uh, to the city clerk. Thank you very much. I would, ex I would uh, hear a motion. A second. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, we have old business, which is a, um, it's an open public hearing. It's uh, temporary health care structures, public act number 17-155, um, the city of Milford opting out of temporary health care structures pursuant to Public Act 17-155, Section 13J, an act concerning temporary health care structures. Um, it's held open. Um, we heard some testimony um, a while back, and we felt it was important to see if there was any other interest in expressing opinions. Uh, David, if you could uh, speak to uh, the history of this, uh, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Uh, during the last legislative session, um, the uh, state legislature um, approved uh, a special act that um, would uh, basically allow uh, people uh, who meet certain criteria uh, related uh, to uh, health to uh, go to their town and uh, ask for a uh, separate uh, structure for them to live in, uh, in the uh, yard of uh, a main structure. Um, and uh, the way the act is written, uh, it's, uh, it's similar to 830G and that uh, uh, if they meet the criteria and they come to us, uh, we are to uh, allow them to do that uh, within uh, 15 days, basically, of them asking. Um, unlike A30G, uh, the legislature uh, actually uh, put in an opt-out provision. So what's going on is uh, the city of Milford um, would like to opt out of this. Uh, and the reason we'd like to opt out of, opt out of this is that we actually have uh, several zoning regulations in place that would in fact allow family members uh, to, if they needed to move into uh, a house, if a, if a um, in-law apartment was needed, you know, we have those regulations. Uh, we also have regulations for um, domestic uh, 
uh, what's called domestic service and management uh, for a house that would allow uh, someone living in, in uh, a separate uh, uh, structure on the property. Um, so uh, the city feels that we have um, uh, the ability to accommodate people um, and often in the past um, they come in for accessory apartment uh, 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 permission. Um, w several of the problems that we would anticipate uh, with this, even if we um, allowed it, is that, um, and, and other communities have found this uh, out before us, is that um, you can get a doctor's note pretty easily. And it, it's, from an enforcement standpoint, something that we're concerned could uh, easily uh, be, um, be abused. Um, the other issue is uh, depending on where they are situated, um, there could be a conflict uh, with wetlands and other things that, you know, typically in the 15 days that the statute requires wouldn't be able to uh, be handled. So right off the bat, uh, when the legislature created this, um, it, they didn't, for whatever reason, consider or talk to uh, some, you know, Connecticut land use folks. So there's there's a, a already a built-in conflict, uh, especially when you're in a coastal community like Milford, where we have a, a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, inland wetlands and uh, shoreline uh, areas. Um, and uh, for those reasons, uh, you know, uh, the city would really like to opt out of this. Um, we could probably do something with the regulations that we currently have, especially for the uh, uh, domestic servant uh, uh, regulation, um, which uh, is um, uh, 3.1.5.2. Uh, we could probably add some language to that for, uh, you know, uh, you know, domestic uh, health care worker, uh, if that made people uh, feel better. Uh, thank you. Um, it is uh, an open public hearing, so if there's anyone who would like to speak on this matter, uh, please come up. Please uh, state your name and address, and please speak into the microphone. Thank you. Hello, Lauren Larkin, 85 Viscount Drive, Unit 14B. Um, I am in favor of the temporary housing, and I'll give you some reasons. I, I did just hear what Mr. Sulkis had to say, but um, thank you for listening to me. This also gives people a different option for a family member who needs care. Last time before I, I was before this bar board, I spoke of my grandmother who was in a nursing home. My grandfather was also in a nursing home five years prior to my grandmother, and the visits were heart-wrenching. He just wanted to go home to die, and that was his words, just wanted to be home. I brought my daughter, his great-granddaughter, to visit him in the nursing home when she was just two weeks old. I put her in his arms, and I could still picture him looking at her, and I took a, a photo. Two weeks later, he passed. My, that was almost 22 years ago. My memory is tainted knowing the final months of his life, all he wanted to do was go home. Instead, he died alone in a nursing home. I also volunteer for hospice. I go into homes or nursing homes to visit patients whose family members have asked a total stranger to go sit with their loved ones to keep them company. I see how busy people are. They're working, they have their own obligations, they have their children, and it's not that they don't care. This current proposal can give some families like these another choice. I read in the paper the Milford City Attorney recommended to opt out. Two of the reasons were a person might charge rent and the city already has regulations for accessory apartments. However, I don't know that you can compare an accessory apartment, which is a permanent addition and more costly than a temporary structure. And I understand there are restrictions with the new proposal to try and prevent abuse, such as one occupant, 
There's a size limit. It's temporary. It's for an uh, impaired family member. Proof is needed, and there are setbacks, and um, the care has to be unpaid. Regarding rent, as far as a family member paying rent or paying for the housing, I don't see that as a problem. A person pays rent, so to speak, to a nursing home. An impaired family member is living somewhere where money is spent paying for housing or bills. If that money is instead used towards this tiny home as an alternative, I think it's a plus. A person could lose their home and life savings to pay for a nursing home care. If they have the option of using that money towards one of these temporary homes instead of a, a permanent structure um, where they are near family, I think it's a win-win. And I really don't see Milford being overrun with these homes. Not all properties will meet the setbacks. It's still an expense, but it's an option to residents. In closing, I'm confident that I don't stand here alone. All three Milford State representatives voted in favor of this bill. The statewide House of Representatives voted 142 in favor to eight opposed. Every state senator voted in favor of this bill. 36 in favor, zero opposed. I think that speaks volumes. Milford's entire delegation who had a vote on this at the state level saw value in this. They know what our current regulations are. Senator Slosberg, who is also an attorney herself, voted in favor of this. I'm asking you not only to hear me, but to listen to our Milford State representatives and senator who have the task of doing what they think is best for our community when voting on these bills. It was unanimous, Republicans and Democrats who voted in favor of these temporary residences. I'm asking you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on the issue? Please state your name and address and speak into the microphone. Donna Dutko, 236 Buckingham Avenue. Um, I am in favor of the city opting out of this regulation statute. Um, the reason being, if somebody, if grandpa's sick enough to be in a nursing home, you can't put him in a pod in the back door, in the backyard like a dog. He needs 24 seven care. You're not gonna have that kind of oversight when he's out and how are you gonna hear if he's crying or he's fallen? I mean, the whole point, if they're, they have a medical condition where they need that kind of intensive care. They need somebody right next to them. And from what I understand, it's for one person only. Is that correct, Mr. Sulkis? I don't believe. You have to address to, to the board. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, not really a question and answer, but thank you. OK. Um, so anyways, my understanding is that it's a one person unit and um, you really need to have somebody with that person 24 seven. That's the whole point of having your family member come home. You don't, you know, otherwise just put them in a trailer somewhere and ship them off. That's my opinion. I took care of my mom for years and, you know, um, we were right there with her the whole time. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Okay, we will close the uh, public hearing. Um, David, would you like to uh, add anything? If uh, when you deliberate this, no matter what you do with it, which, um, you just need to uh, specify for the record uh, the reasons why you, if you, when you take a vote, why you're voting. So if you're uh, staying, uh, if you're staying, want to opt in, you really don't, you don't have to do anything. You could just say that where you, that you want to opt in. Uh, if you uh, say that you want to opt out, uh, then for the record, uh, you're required to give reasons uh, why. Great, thank you. I'd like to open up the board for any, uh, any comment or conversation. I'd like to just mention that uh, the, the state statute requires that the structure has to be uh, basically uh, 500, no, no more than 500 square feet 
and it has to have electrical, heating, and sanitary. So basically, I, I've gone through this with my own parents, but to me, our regulations allow for people to add onto the house or modify the house, and I believe it would be a lot cheaper than going to a pre-built manufacturer for a miniature house, then paying for either a septic system to be put in or tied into the sewer system, then running electrical uh, service out to it, um, and then putting in a heating system. Uh, uh, so I think opt out is, is our best bet. Uh, we do have regulations, and as David mentioned, we can make some modifications to make it a little bit better, uh, and I would be in favor of doing that. That's the question for staff. Um, is there any financial impact um, based off the regulations today or in the future if we choose to opt out that residents might not be able to get assistance from the government or any juice? Now, the, uh, all, all this uh, statute uh, deals with is the ability to, to place one of these structures in, in a yard as long as it meets the accessory uh, structure setbacks uh, and basically override zoning if, in fact, um, you, you do nothing, they can come in and do that. It, has, it doesn't impact one way or the other whatever uh, uh, benefits uh, they can get from wherever they're getting benefits from. That has, uh, that's not a zoning issue, that's more of a social service issue. It, it shouldn't impact any social service issues. Any other thoughts from board members? Mr. Quich, um, to Mr. Sulkis, do you see that if we were to um, not opt out totally, is there any way this could be controlled through regulations? I mean, that would make it more doable? Whether it's the, uh, directly from the statute, we go by just what they have in the statute, or we create a, a, another set of specialized regulations, it all comes down to, uh, in the end, the ability to enforce. And this kind of use uh, would be difficult to enforce. Um, there's, no, there's no time limits uh, you know, by statute. Um, you, know, you could, in theory, have someone ask for this use or put this use in, and it could be there for 30 years. And, you know, you're basically, you have someone living, you now have, have two units on one property next door, you know, because you don't necessarily have to be old to have this. You just have to have a medical condition. So you could have, you know, a teenager or a young adult who has some uh, medical condition that meets the requirements, and that structure could be there a very, very long time versus having an accessory apartment that is either part of the main structure that's already there uh, or an addition that's put onto a structure that's already there, which uh, is uh, historically how we've handled them here in Milford. Okay, thank you. I, I mean, I understand that there can always be abuses to anything, obviously. Um, and I don't know if that will totally be the case. My concern might be with an accessory structure, or obviously that's a permanent part of the house, and the taxes obviously change on that house now, right? How would a structure like this be taxed, if at all? My understanding is you have a structure on your property, it's subject to being taxed. Even though it's a temporary structure, it would still be taxed? Uh, I mean, obviously, if it was there a year, then the taxation goes away. Our regulations specifically, um, let me see here, I wrote it down, uh, under our, what we call our building conversion regulations, 3.1.2.20, say that any kind of conversion, any kind of, of to a particular use that's on the property has to be built to the required standards. So based on the statute and having it connected to sewer and septic, this building will have a foundation or be anchored to the ground because our regulations would re require something like that. Um, it's, it could be temporary. 
Yeah, I mean, we see homes that are built uh, here in town that, you know, gee, that's a permanent house. Oh no, on second thought, they wanted to rebuild it. They knock it down, they build an, a bigger one. So, um, Un understood. I guess I'm just weighing in my mind what the intent of this statute was and trying to weigh that against what the abuses might be. Keep in mind the statute was written for the entire state. So you have towns in this state. You, uh, I think there's still one town left that doesn't have zoning. So, you know, there are places where you don't have regulations for accessory apartments. And by all means, the, the legislature did, did, their heart was in the right place, their voting for it was uh, in the right place, and it was in the right place because there was a caveat that was built in. Uh, communities could opt out. And in communities, you know, we just had a, a zoning lesson before this. Um, we have R5 zones. That's a, that's a huge swath of the city, 5,000 square foot lots. Um, they have accessory structures on them. So now picture a 5,000 square foot lot with a main house on it and a 500 square foot building, which is, is the size of a garage and a pretty big garage. Um, you know, that's, that's an awful lot of, uh, of uh, infrastructure to be in, in one spot uh, versus having uh, the ability to have someone in the house. Un un understood. Um, I guess the other part that I read through this statute was that they were trying to streamline this process somehow. Um, and I didn't know if we could address that at all. Well, and, and that's actually part of the problem. They could, because they, in the process, they said, ah, if, if you don't opt out, then um, someone comes in and asks for this. It's a streamlined process. Um, we have to give them a building permit in 15 days. And to design something that meets the standards that we would need, um, you need more than 15 days. They would hopefully do that ahead of time. But um, you would then, again, in the instance of, of wetlands, you know, you're designing something or you, you need, you want to put this in and you want it in the 15 days, well, now you're going to have a built-in conflict with the Inland Wetlands Commission because if you're in a zone or on a property that abuts something that comes under their jurisdiction, that's not a 15-day process. That's a multi-month process. Um, Thank you. Uh, any other comments or concerns from the board? Um, I'd like to speak to the issue. I think that uh, I think that the state legislature made it very clear, and I think that one of the salient points is that it was really unanimous in the Senate, and it was a great majority in the House, and that it was well thought out. And if it helps one person uh, in, this, in the community to go through something that's pretty difficult when, when someone's health is failing in your family and you can support them, um, I think it's a, it's a very simple decision to allow it. I don't see any real plurality of abuse. Potential f of abuse is everywhere, but um, I really don't see anyone going through the, pro the trouble to do this if it wasn't really a family emergency. And I would personally support uh, any motion that would um, decide not to opt out and to uh, follow this uh, um, edict from, from our state legislature. Any other comments or concerns? All right, well, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion to approve opting out of the state regulation. John, I think you need to state your reason. I think you need to state your reason. Oh, reason being I feel that our, our current zoning regulations make plenty of adjustments for people uh, to accommodate for ill family members. And also I believe the, because the state statute says that it has to be a pre-built unit, um, those are pretty costly as people know, plus adding sewers, electricity, and, and water services to these, um, I believe the costs would be far more than 
uh, adjusting into an existing structure. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Just w with the motion, if uh, the motion is to approve opting out, um, if we were to vote against that regulate or that that motion, does that mean that we then take another vote if we want to opt in with tweaking regulations or such? Um, I think if the motion fails, we would need another motion. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, David. You would need if you want to um, stay in. Uh, you would you would make a motion to stay in. Um, I wouldn't necessarily include in that motion, oh, tweaking the regulations, because we would have to, you can opt to stay in, we would have to figure out what kind of regulations uh, you, know, you would want to see. And that will probably take a little while to craft, because we would have to figure out, uh, we'd be one of the few communities, maybe one or two, that maybe have done that. So we would have to sort of, uh, it's, so it's new territory because we have to craft it to be compliant with the statute as well as uh, what our desires are. Thank you. I mean, I, I would say that uh, there's an entire um, industry around tiny houses in small living quarters that is uh, very robust and great architectural ideas are coming out all around. So um, to talk about the cost, I think, is not one of our concerns. I think that it is a concern of uh, the individual family. So if, in fact, their best, um, their best cost-benefit analysis is to put an addition on the house and go through that whole entire process with architects and, and whatever, um, then if it's more cost-effective for them, then that's the way they would go. For some people, I mean, again, my argument is if it helps one person, it's worth just saying, yes, let it happen. It's no burden to anybody else if somebody has a benefit. Um, so again, I would just um, lend my voice to um, allowing what uh, the state legislature has uh, put forward as a way of helping a family who is in turmoil. And I don't see any downside. If there's a little bit of, uh, you know, oversight that needs to happen, well, that's why we're here. You know, the city's getting paid, getting taxpayer money to oversee whatever we need to oversee. And again, if it helps one family or a dozen families, I think it's worth considering and, and uh, supporting. Mr. Thank Savvy. you, if you recognize me. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Grant, uh, clarification on the motion. Is the motion that you're making to opt out for the purpose of not allowing this type of use completely. Is that the, the purpose of the motion? Thank you. Any other comments or discussion? Just, just to clarify, I, I just want uh, Mr. Sadi uh, just to understand that the opting out is because of the statute requires us either to stay in or opt out. The use itself that we've described this evening, again, could be uh, done through other means. So we're not we're not saying that someone who is uh, uh, who needs uh, to live, you know, in, in a house with their relatives, uh, you know, can't do that. They can. Just making sure. Exactly. But the point of the entire legislation was to make it easier. And although Mr. Grant thinks it may be harder, the, a lot of people think it may be easier for a family to accommodate a sick person in their family. So I don't think it's a given either way. I think it's a choice that each family would make, which is most cost effective, which is the best for their family. So it just adds an option. And, uh, in my, and again, my belief is it harms no one. Mr. Chairman, uh, I agree. Uh, I believe that we can't make that choice for the residents of Milford. They have to make that choice themselves. Um, and they should have that option uh, to be able to do that. Thank you. Any further comment or discussion? Seeing none, we'll take a vote on the motion, which is to opt out. 
I'm with the motion. Mr. Collegian. We'll call the roll. Mr. Collegian, I'm can sorry. you restate it's your vote, Brian please? Brian Collegian, and I'm with the motion. Ms. Austin. With the motion. Mr. Grant. With the motion. Mr. Moore. Against the motion. Mr. Marlowe. Against the motion. Mr. Penzella. With the motion. Ms. Dusad Janice. Against the motion. Mr. Saudi. Against the motion. Ms. Kearney. And Mr. Krish. Against the motion. It's a tie. But we do not have a successful uh, motion. We could um, entertain a, another motion. Uh, we need to. Uh, uh, actually, David, if you would counsel us, I think we need to have another motion. You would need another motion because the motion didn't pass because it's a tie. So in the in the case where we have another motion um, to uh, accept the, the, the state law and not opt out, and then that's a 5-5, what happens then? I guess you're not gonna be doing anything with this. Uh, again, it would fail, so in effect, the, uh, the state, uh, you, you haven't opted out. So it's the act of opting out, not opting in. So you know, if you don't opt out, then you're automatically in. Okay, so we don't need another motion. We have not opted out. That's the end of it. Unless, unless someone makes a motion. I mean, that motion failed. If someone makes another motion because they want a different okay, vote on something else. Okay, the table's open if anyone would like to make a motion. Mr. Grish, for, for discussion anyway, um, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, opt in, and I'm not sure how to word this, that because I, I don't want to just opt in with no chance to look at regulations and see if there's something that we need to change that would specifically address some of the concerns of other board members with this. So I, I'm not sure how that really gets worded because I know that puts now the burden on Mr. Solkis uh, to look at those regulations and to discuss with us what we might want to see. So my understanding from what uh, David had said, and he'll correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, the, if we wanted to put some uh, boundaries or parameters on that, it would kind of be a separate issue. I think it would come up as a, you know, something from the Rules Committee or something from staff in a regulation change. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, and let me just reiterate what your, you have three options, and let me remind everyone what they are. Follow the provisions of the act and allow the installation uh, of the use in compliance with the act, um, the, which is what we currently have. Opting out of the act uh, for the purpose of creating our own zoning regulations incorporating provisions of the act. And three, opting out for the purpose of not uh, allowing this kind of thing. So if you do nothing, um, you're already in because we didn't opt out. So if you want to have regulations uh, for this, then we can work on creating regulations for it. Um, but you're, you're without an actual opting out, you're, you're, you're in. I mean, if the board comes up with a, a different uh, vote of some sort, I mean, depending on what the motion is, but you're, 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 it's, there's no choice to opt in. You're, you're, you're opting out, you're automatically in. You, you start in. Go ahead, John. I just want to mention that based on what you're saying, um, like I said, I, I really feel, uh, I agree with Jim on a lot of the items. I mean, I've gone through with my own parents and, and my in-laws also, um, but uh, for the options, but uh, I think with what we have in regulations now, uh, plus when we put our heads together, we can come up with something that's even better uh, that I think would actually serve the city citizens of Milford a lot better than just saying, yeah, you can go stick a you know, $150,000 uh, tiny house in the backyard. Well, it seems like um, 
where we are. Go ahead, David. All I was going to say is if you're thinking about creating your own regulations, if that's one of the options, then that's option number two, which is opting out. So it puts the brakes on someone coming in immediately and saying, you know, give me a permit in 15 days, and we come up with the regulations. So that's the opt out with the, the regulation uh, provision. You can do, and you can, and that would be that you would have to put that in the motion. You're opting out, but you're letting the world know that you're opting out of the statutory one because you want to come up with regulations that incorporate what the statute requires and whatever our own concerns are. So, uh, so for clarification, at this point, we had a motion, we had a second, we had a vote, and we voted, um, we, we, we did not vote to opt out. So we're automatically in. I would say that at this point, we're automatically in. If the Rules Committee or, uh, or there's another, um, if we want to put it back on the agenda, it can come back. This is not, you know, um, cl closing the door and locking it. Um, but at this point, I'd like to move on. And uh, if somebody wants to um, bring this up in the future, uh, then that, that can happen. But right now, I see it as we have not opted out. I, I'd like to clear this up this evening, if, if possible. Oh, uh, I'd like to make another motion to opt out uh, based on what David said, with the option that we come up with our own regulations uh, to uh, take care of this item and benefit the city better. Um, I don't really see how that works, but uh, David, uh, maybe you can school us. You, it, you can have multiple motions. I mean, we have done that, I won't, won't say regularly, but when we've had unusual situations, the board you know, can come up with you know, further motions. And then, you know, depending on what happens, I mean, that's what, you know, you, you may get the same outcome, you, you may not. Okay, um, I'll entertain another motion. I'd like to second this motion. motion to opt out with the uh, option that we set, uh, look at our existing regulations and come up with some new ones to, uh, to uh, make it better for everybody all the way around. I'm sorry, would you repeat that, John? Okay. Uh, I'd like to make the motion that we opt out of the state statute uh, with the option uh, that we come up with our regulations and in, uh, newer, new regulations and reinforce the existing regulations that we have that would uh, achieve the same options uh, that the state would, would automatically give by having another house. Mr. Chair? Can I offer some language that um, may be... Uh, Please do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, sure, go ahead. I, I would recommend a motion to opt out for the purpose of creating our own zoning regulations incorporating the provisions of the Act. Second that. And, uh, okay, so now we'll open that up for discussion. My first uh, discussion would be to staff... Um, is there any uh, statutory requirement on how long um, that would take and what would happen if we have a, an application or a, or a situation that presents itself before we have actually uh, created the language for, uh, for our own regulation? Um, what would happen is um, they, uh, the applicant wouldn't be able to do it because you have opted out pending your approval of new regulations. So we can start working on new regulations, you know, immediately. Um, I would ask Mr. Grant if we could put a, uh, a uh, six week time frame on seeing language of a new regulation. Would you add that to your uh, motion? I have no objection to that. Mr. Panzella, your second, would that be fine? That's, that's fine. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Um, let's uh, call the roll. I'm sorry, stand corrected. Any discussion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I disagree with the interpretation by the Planning and Zoning uh, 
uh, Mr. Mr. Salkis, because when I'm reading the statute, it indicates that the municipality, which is the Board of Aldermen, can opt out if we have had a public hearing and we opt out and affirmatively do so by a vote. It does not indicate anywhere in the statute, I'm looking at it right now, that indicates we can opt out with conditions. I don't know where that came from. I'm not sure where it's found in the act. And I think that just as I'm reading the statute, we make our decision. And if we opt out, then it goes to the Board of Aldermen to make the final decision. Thank you. Uh, Dave, would you speak to that? Well, I didn't come up with it by myself. <laughs> I believe it came, uh, there were, I handed out to you a, a guidance sheet uh, that was an interpretation of the statute that uh, is used by the uh, Connecticut Planning Association. And that, in my understanding, has been tested uh, in other uh, places throughout, uh, other municipalities throughout the state. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, sir. The, in your packet originally was a, um, uh, a guidance sheet from the uh, Connecticut chapter of the American Planning Association that uh, talked about uh, those options, uh, which my understanding is has been tested and used uh, throughout the state and other communities. Uh, we're, we're sort of coming into the game a little late, uh, but those are the options. And Mr. Sadie is right. Ultimately, in the end, uh, the Board of Aldermen you know, also has to weigh in, but you still have to make a recommendation. Mr. Sadi, does that seem to make sense to you, or do you still have questions? Um, my questions have not been answered. I think to either opt out, you don't opt out with conditions. I don't, I don't, disagree, I don't disagree with the, the document they have there, but as I'm reading the statute, you either opt out by affirmative vote, and then you send it on to the Board of Aldermen. We've had a public hearing, and we had to make a decision whether we're going to opt out or not. It so we're, we're going to have to bring this to a close tonight. We're going to have to uh, bring it up at, once we get uh, clarification on the language that you presented, uh, Mr. Salkis, in it, relation you can, to the question that it, Mr. Sadie has. Uh, opting out is a two-step process requiring the Planning and Zoning Commission to vote to opt out and then the municipality's legislative body to vote to opt out. Uh, uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, must do something before the, uh, the Board of Aldermen can, but you, there's nothing to prevent you from opting out, making the recommendation because you have a particular intent. You know, th 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 that's very different than what was said earlier. This was, this was, you gave us three clear choices that were somewhere in, in the legislation, that it was either opt in, opt out, are opt out with the intent to create a regulation. If we don't have that language in stone for Mr. Sadi, I don't think we can act further. You don't need in stone legislation to tell you that you can create regulations to do this. That's I, I know, that, that's not the way it was presented. It was presented that it was a three-pronged choice from the, the legislator. Legislation. Well, it, I, I apologize if that's how it was interpreted, but I'm just telling you what other municipalities have done. Yeah. When, okay. when, when they have, when they have, again, no matter what happens, it still goes to the Board of Aldermen, but you can, you can opt out, and your reason for opting out is because you want to create your own regulations, and you pass that on to the Board of Aldermen. So if the Ald Board of Aldermen agrees with you, they might not agree with you. They might say, eh, you know, uh, leave it the way it is. Um, but if they agree with you, there's nothing to preclude you uh, from creating the regulations which we would be working on. Understood. Thank you. You know where we're going to stand tonight? We had a vote to opt out. It failed, so we have not opted out, and we're going to go with that for tonight. We're going to move on. Thank you. I don't think that's correct. We have a motion and we have a second. Well, and I think that you're, 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 you're bringing your own opinion into this. No, I just think that we're putting it to this point. I think I we've think gone we on too long. Well, no, thank you, Tom. Sure, I really to think we need to, to act on the motion and the second. I just don't know if the second motion was either required or, or, or not, so I'm sorry.
motion? Personally, I think you're wrong, but uh, I'm not the chairman and I don't make these decisions. But That's fine. Uh, it's just we've been on like this for said, a long we time. Have a, we have a motion and we have a second, and I think we should vote on it. No, and, and Tom, I, and, and I appreciate that. And I think we had a motion and it happened. Why we accepted a second motion was from information that I got from staff that I now feel is not f fully legitimate in terms of why we needed to have a second motion. So my bad. Anyway, we're going to go forward. We can still take it up. It goes to the Board of Aldermen. If we want to address it at another time, there's nothing to stop us. But we've got a lot of people here and a lot of other issues to deal with. So we're going to move forward at this point. Thank you. Mr. Salkis, is Jim correct? My understanding is that his opinion of what he wants to do is not per parliamentary procedures or Robert's Rules of Orders, whatever we follow. Uh, we have a motion on the floor, and I feel that it has to be voted on. Based on uh, the past practice of the board, when we've had unusual votes that were, were ties or confusing, the board has, has issued other motions. So, you know, I'll leave it up to the chair, but, you know, I think that there's a motion on the floor that uh, you know, may be legitimate, and you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know what to, at this point, you know, say. Uh, but based on on past practice, uh, there have been occasions where this board has um, done business with more than one motion. I respect that. Um, we have, again, I'm going to say it again. We have had a motion; it did not pass. We're going to move forward. Thank you. All right, we have uh, next order of business is uh, proposed text regulation amendment 521 and 523.1 of the Milford Zoning Regulations to exempt light emanating from one and two family dwellings in residential zones for light regulations. Um, David, would you speak to us, please? Sure. So before you uh, tonight is a recommendation uh, from uh, staff in the city uh, to um, change our uh, currently existing uh, light uh, regulations. Um, you have uh, in front of you, hopefully, uh, the staff report uh, regarding this. Uh, basically, we have language uh, in the regulations that um, are unenforceable and have never been enforced because they're unenforceable. Uh, uh, unlike commercial projects uh, subject to the provisions of site plan reviews, which include photometric surveys, uh, single family uses in residential zones um, are not subject to site plan, the site plan review process. Uh, the city historically has not interpreted the zoning regulations in a manner such as that residential lighting issues would result in the issuance of a cease and desist order. Uh, without photometric surveys on file, we can't compel a homeowner to provide the information in the case of a dispute over lighting levels. Further, staff does not have the ability to inspect and make determinations of lighting issues after business hours, which is typically when there is a light complaint. Without the ability to enforce the provisions on single-family homes, it's recommended uh, to remove the unenforceable regulation. Uh, the city attorney's office supports this decision as we do not typically bring actions to court that stem from private uh, disputes between neighbors. Um, so that's pretty much it in a nutshell. We would still have lighting regulations for uh, commercial uses, and you'll see those uh, photometric surveys as you always uh, have done. Um, uh, so that wouldn't change. Thank you. Okay, so this is a public hearing. Um, if anyone would like to speak in favor of this, um, the text change, please come up. Anyone would like to speak against this text change, please come to the podium. Please state your name, your address, and please speak into the microphone and limit your comments to about three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Barbara Schellenberg. I am an attorney with Cohen and Wolf in Orange, and I am here tonight representing William and Tammy Moratolo, who are Milford homeowners residing at 18 Chelsea Place. 
and I appreciate the opportunity to address the Commission tonight. We are asking that you not adopt this proposed regulation. Right now, the regulations protect all residential, residential property owners like the Moratolos against light pollution from neighboring residences. This has been a serious problem for them because their neighbor has such bright outdoor lighting emanating from his property that every single night this light, light is shining into the Moratolo's bedroom. And in the summertime when the weather was nice and they wanted to sit outside on their patio and enjoy their backyard and pool, they could not do so because of the lighting that was coming, the excessive lighting that was coming from the neighboring property. And obviously this almost constant disturbance has greatly decreased their ability to use and enjoy their home and property. If the commission adopts this regulation, notwithstanding the issues that, that staff mentioned with regard to enforcement, there is going to be a message that will be sent not only to the Maritolo's neighbor, but other residential property owners in Milford that this kind of behavior is okay when it is clearly unacceptable. I don't think that's something the commission really wants to see happen. I believe this commission wants residents to feel comfortable in their homes. And in Milford, the reality is that many residential properties are very close to one another. Consequently, if this regulation is adopted, there's even a greater opportunity, there will be a greater opportunity for spiteful neighbors, or even a neighbor who is not spiteful, but is unintentionally causing light pollution to continue such undesirable behavior. Another perhaps unforeseen problem with this proposed regu regulation is that if adopted, it could even undermine a private lawsuit for nuisance. You now, again, have a regulation that doesn't allow light pollution on residential properties, but are considering exempting certain residential properties. If that regulation is adopted and a private lawsuit is filed, I would expect that the defendant would point to that action on the part of the commission and say, I can't be enjoined from doing what I'm doing or forced to pay damages because my activity is permitted under the zoning regulations. I don't think that's a result the commission wants either. And this, is, this proposed regulation may also violate the uniformity requirements of the general statutes. For example, affordable housing complexes are allowed in one and two family residential zones. So the way I read this proposed regulation, it would allow a one or two family residence to have a bright light shining on an affordable housing complex, but not vice versa. And that just doesn't seem to make any sense. These are some issues that we've identified in a very short period of time. We only learned about this public hearing a few days ago, and I've just been retained by the Moratolos. Um, so we would ask that you keep this public hearing open to give us the opportunity to do some more research and perhaps present some other uh, issues to you. And I would ask that commission members um, go to Chelsea Circle and take a look for yourselves at, at what's going on there. Uh, toward that end, Mr. Maritolo is here and he has a simulation of uh, the lighting and some photos, and he would like the opportunity to show that to you so you could really have a better understanding of what, is, what his family has been experiencing on a daily basis and what could be a problem for other Mi Milford residents. He made this same presenta presentation to the ZBA back in June when that board overturned the ZEO's approval of his neighbor's lights. Uh, would that be something that the commission would permit? Um, again, thank you for your presentation. We would consider that. Right, and we'll let the next person speak, and we'll address that afterwards. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you.
Again, please state your name and address. Speak into the microphone. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and board members. Uh, my name is Joseph Tazola, 118 Gulf Street. Uh, I'm also uh, the current uh, chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, in uh, June 13th of 2017, we had a, uh, a hearing for no privacy with excessive lighting from neighbors property directed at their home. Uh, why would we exempt light emanating from one and two family dwellings in residential zones? It has been said that it's, it's not enforceable. Well, maybe we should find a way to enforce it. Now, this could be led to harassment from neighbor to neighbor, and shouldn't we protect our citizens? I'm against this amendment. Thank you. How you doing? Uh, William Soda, 35 Edgemont Road, Milford, Connecticut. I'm also a current member on the ZBA, and we had this hearing on Chelsea, and I would like him to plug those lights in and show you, because he did them for us, and let me tell you, these are LED lights, and they were blinding. When he shut them off, I still had white spots in front of me, and uh, he showed us the pictures, and I mean, you couldn't even live in this house the way the amount of light was coming in. So I'm against this text change. From what I understand, the CEO told me that the current has uh, the current text is the amount of lumens. Well, the LED technology has advanced so much that they're brighter. You know, now you get a hundred watt LED that puts out 400 watts of comparable metal halide light. So, um, you know, you need to keep this in the regulations. You know, to um, protect homeowners. You know, these are citizens, voters, and they need all the help they can get. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Me again, Donna Jetco, 236 Buckingham Avenue. Um, I have to compliment the attorney who mentioned the uniformity requirement. Um, I do believe that all regulations have to be uniform with, throughout the zone in any particular area. So if it's a R7, Lighting has to be the same for every property. If it's a mixed-use property, lighting has to be the same throughout. I could be wrong, but I do believe there's such a thing as uniformity um, rules for zoning. So I think that this is going to open up a can of worms to allow non-residential properties to say, oh, everything has to be equal. Um, we can shine our lights, too. Thank you. Good evening, Brian Anderson, 49 Ingersoll Road, Milford. Uh, first of all, I'd like to extend congratulations to the newer members of the board. Welcome. Um, and uh, to you, Mr. Chairman, on your election. Um, I'm here to speak against the text change. As an alderman, I have been involved uh, throughout the duration of uh, my uh, having been an alderman in local lighting disputes. Um, shortly after my election in 2011, uh, there was a complaint that was filed um, where there was an individual that was using lighting in a punitive manner against a neighbor whom he had an issue with, the mayor, uh, newly elected and myself got involved in that issue uh, to, to attempt to resolve it. There have been many times that I have called the ZEO to uh, have an issue dealt with and it has been successfully dealt with. Um, sometimes it does take a while for it to be resolved. It may take several months, it may take a year or a couple of years, but uh, I can think of at least six instances where I've had to uh, follow up with the zoning enforcement officer to have a problem taken care of, okay? So that's one issue. The other issue, as Mr. Soda mentioned, I think you need to keep in mind that as individuals are converting to LEDs, 
the high intensity of the LEDs um, is, uh, is an area that we have not fully um, seen, um, we've not fully uh, seen the results from. I think, uh, I can think of instances where people are using the same fixtures that they've had for years and they're simply converting it to LEDs and um, it's lighting up the night in a major way. Um, so I'd like to have you keep that in mind. And then finally, I would say that a number of us argued that Milford needed to adopt a 3,000 Kelvin LED street light program as opposed to the 4,000 that was originally proposed. Um, that's in the offing. That will be implemented um, over the course of the next several weeks and uh, we don't know what effect that's going to have. So I happen to believe that this text change is a non-solution uh, in search of a problem and I urge that you defeat this. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Got one thing again, William Soda, 35 Edgemont Road. I would like to see the text change change so that it would just say residential exterior lights need to be adjusted or shielded to keep the light off the neighbor's house. You do a simple change like that, it would solve a lot of problems and be easy to enforce. Thank you. Stefan Pavrosnik, 312 Wheelers Farms Road. Um, first, I'd like to congratulate the members uh, for being on the board, and I appreciate your time and your efforts, your future efforts. Mr. Sulkis, it's good to see you again. Uh, I was on the Planning and Zoning Board when the last regulations were written, so I understand what the intent was. And the intent was that uh, there should be, uh, you can have outdoor lighting in residential, but the light cone should uh, uh, diminish before it gets to the property, uh, the no next door neighbor's property. I'm sorry I'm a little uh, off here. I'm not feeling well today. Um, I was at the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting, uh, hearing for this one particular application, but I came out of my concern for the lighting issue, um, and I voiced my uh, uh, concurrence with the landowner. landowner. Uh, there are different types of lights. I'm an electrical engineer, and I do deal with lighting. Uh, I ask that the board keep the uh, hearing open. If you like, I'll bring uh, some engineering data for you next month. <clears throat> there are different kind of lights. I think we've all seen them before. They're the old uh, mercury vapor lights, the uh, high pressure sodium lights. Uh, now we have the new LED lights. They do put out more aluminums. Uh, <clears throat> so it's easy to detect. You can go to your local hardware store and buy a light uh, meter to detect how much light is trespassing over the property line. Uh, if you don't do that, then imagine this. I'm gonna walk up to you. Our steam city planner told you earlier that there are different zones in the city of Milford, and some of them are lower, less than 5,000 square feet. Down on the beach in certain areas of town, that's how close some of the houses are. Can you imagine somebody putting a high pressure light and have it shine straight into your bedroom? What a nuisance and harassment that would be to you and it would diminish your uh, enjoyment where you live. And that should, that should not be allowed to happen. So I would ask that you keep the hearing open and uh, be uh, glad to help uh, give you more information. Thank you. Thank you. And would anyone else like to speak? Does any one of the board members feel like we want to keep the uh, public hearing open? Or does somebody, does anyone feel like we should close it? I think we should keep the uh, hearing open. 
Anyone else? Okay, that's good enough for me. We'll keep the public hearing open. We'll bring it up next, uh, next time and we will readdress it. Thank you. Next uh, item of business is 32 Milford Point Road, Zone R75, Petition of Cypress Builders, LLC, for a special permit, site plan review, and CAM for an elevated single family home, Map 6, Block 88, Parcel 10, of which Bjeka Properties, LLC, is the owner. Hello, board. I'm Jesse Rolleter, 26 Gillette Street, Milford, Connecticut. And I'm representing. Do you Dr. please speak into the mic closely? Thanks. Sorry. Sure. Jesse Rolleter, 26 Gillette Street, Milford, Connecticut. And we're here to look to get approval to construct a single family home at 32 Milford Point Road. If I get any questions or. You want to take us through the Are those your drawings up? Or no, that's. No. That's those, someone else's. That's someone else's, <laughs> yes. Uh, is, is there any part of the project you'd like to. Uh, detail for us or you just want to leave it for what you said? We, we look to construct on wood piles and uh, so there's no foundation and they just come out and drive the wood piles in and we'll build right on top of that. Uh, we've done this once before and everything worked well. So. Okay. Uh, staff? Uh, the applicant will be constructing a new three-story house elevated on piers. It's 21 feet from the mean high water line which being less than 25 feet triggers the need for the special permit. Uh, there appears to be no adverse impact to coastal resources. There are no outstanding engineering issues. Okay, well this is a public hearing, so if there's anyone like to speak um, on this, please come to the podium. Seeing none, we will uh, close the public hearing and um, find is there any comment from any board members or questions I got a couple of questions sure um, our regulations require that on the site plan you uh, establish what the average grade is I could not find that on the, any place on the drawings also uh, the architectural drawings show the slab elevation at, at 8.5 feet the architectural drawings uh, shows the slab at 10.1 feet um, and there was a little insert that said that there was no information as far as what the uh, what the elevations are um, and by my calculations uh, based on uh, the you know, drawings that you submitted you took the average uh, height to the midpoint but you took it off the slab instead of from average grade uh, which, when I did the calculations, you're basically you got about eight inches to spare by taking it off the slab. So, with no establishment of the uh, of the grade, I can't tell if you meet the 35 feet requirement uh, or if you're over that. Um, by my calculations, you're basically about a foot and a half for the grade is below the 8.6 uh, or 8.5 feet. So, uh, until you get that squared away, I would, I would say we would have to hold this open until you can get your drawings coordinated. Could I present this to you? This was I had that one. We're, there's no grade on that. You say you're three and a half feet below. You're saying that one says your slab is three and a half feet above grade. I, I, you'd never get a car up there. This one is shown from the garage to the beam would be seven foot, and average grade is three foot three below that grade, uh, below that garage slab. Now, the architectural that you submitted says that the, uh, doesn't, doesn't show what average grade is. And, and I do the, apologize, the and that's why. The site drawing that you submitted doesn't show what the average grade is. That's why we put this in there. All right, can you tell me how you're gonna get a car going up three and a half feet up to this lab to park underneath? Well, this all came up, the, the, really the reason why we had to elevate the slab so much is because uh, public works now requires us to be, a, I believe it's a foot and a half over the midpoint of the street. Mr. Solkis, correct. Mr. 
talking to. Are you aware of that? I, that's the first time I ever heard of this. It's, it's something uh, between the engineering and public works department that they, uh, they're, they're trying to anticipate raising streets along the shoreline. So they want to make sure that people will be able to access their properties uh, if the streets are raised. So my apologies, but that is why we created the second page because we were going through and that was one of the requirements that we needed to go up so that our slab was a foot and a half over. As I understood, in case you wanted to pave the street, it didn't get so close and you had positive pitch away from your house. So that's why we made the separate sheet to submit so that, it, that, that could pretty much hopefully clear up your answer, uh, your question. Yeah, it answers the question. Uh all right, I put you there, okay. Uh, all right, then uh, just as a point, just so you know, uh, uh, it has nothing to do with zoning, but um, you might want to check with your engineer. You show an LVLs as your main beams. LVLs are not rated to be exposed to weather. Uh, so you might want to check with that to make sure that that's correct. Also, your wind calculations are based on the 20, uh, 2001 wood frame manual and the code requires you use the 2012 so right. you've got a couple of things you need to check before you go to zone, uh, build building it. okay okay absolutely and we would plan to uh, we have wrapped them the, the LVLs as well I, you know otherwise we, if we couldn't wrap them we'd have to use a PSL pressure treated so I definitely comprehend what you're saying and yep appreciate it thank you, thank you. any further comments questions Seeing none, uh, I guess the, the public area is closed. And uh, is there any reason anyone sees why we should keep this open? And just, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, just to uh, maybe uh, soothe Mr. Grant's concerns, um, even uh, when the board approves uh, something like this, when it comes time for them to get their permits, the information is, is also checked for the ultimate building height. I mean, there have been occasions where the board has approved something and for some reason there, something wasn't clear on the plans, they have come into the office and it's discovered, oh, your building is too high. Well, then they have to, they don't get a pass because the board approved it, they still have to meet the regulations. So if for some reason when it comes to the office, if the building is uh, too high, based on our regulations, uh, it'll have to be lowered. Great, thank you for that. All right, I would entertain a motion. I make a motion to approve. We have a second. Any uh, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, we'd call the roll. I'm Mr. With Collegian, the motion. Ms. Austin. With the motion, Mr. Grant. With the motion. Mr. Moore. With the motion. Mr. Marlowe. With the motion. Mr. Panzella. With the motion. Mr. Sajanis. With the motion. Mr. Sadi. With the motion. Ms. Kearney. With the motion. And Mr. Quish. With the motion. Motion passes, thank you. Thank you very much, board. Thank you, Mr. Sulkis. We're gonna take a, a couple minute recess for technical reasons. Thank you.
Okay, we'll be back in session in one minute. We're up, right? Petition of Thomas Lynch Esquire for modification of application for 12 unit multifamily development per Connecticut Senate General Statute 830G on map 26, block 263, parcel 15, approved with conditions by the board on 12 5, of which Beachland LLC is the owner. Mr. Lynch. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and again, for the record, my name is Thomas Lynch. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Lynch, Trimbicki, and Boynton, and my office is located here in Milford at 63 Cherry Street. And I'm back before you tonight with my clients, Peter Romick and uh, Bill Colombo. They're the principals of Beachland LLC. <clears throat> They're also the owners of the property located at 328 Meadowside Avenue. And uh, we're here tonight on a resubmission per the provisions of Section 830GH of our statutes. Uh, the original application was brought to you uh, this past fall. The board, I think, the minutes indicated, uh, or the, the call indicated that the vote was on 12-5. I think it was held on 12-19. But regardless, uh, at your uh, December meeting, you voted to approve this application with a number of conditions. <clears throat> and I'm reading directly from the statute to you, uh, just for the record. Uh, there's a procedure following a decision by a commission to reject an affordable housing application or to an approve an application with restrictions which have a substantial adverse impact on the viability of the affordable housing development. The application within the 15-day appeal period may come back before you with a resubmission of the, cert of the original application to address some of your concerns and some of the conditions that you imposed. <clears throat> and that's what we're doing tonight. Uh, we went back to the drawing board. There were some four conditions that the board uh, made as part of the approval. Uh, we are submitting to you now plans that address uh, adequately, we believe, three of those uh, conditions. There's a fourth condition which we feel we cannot meet, and I'll speak uh, to that in a minute. <clears throat> but. Uh, I'm going to turn things over to Washington Cambesis, who was our project engineer. He has amended the site plan and it was submitted to you that addresses the drainage issues that came up during <clears throat> the course of the public hearing. There were some concerns about privacy, so the plans uh, have been amended to provide for uh, uh, a boundary fence. Uh, there's also the installation in the uh, driveway area of pavers to address a concern about uh, uh, delivery trucks coming onto the property to be able to turn around within the confines of the driveway and exit the property. So I'm going to turn things over to Washington, 
have him walk you through those changes to the site plan, and then I'm going to come back and speak about the last condition, which we feel we can't meet. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Washington Cabezas of uh, Cabezas D'Angelo's Engineers and Surveyors, 78 Elm Street in Bridgeport. Um, there's four modifications to the plan. Uh, two of them are right on the site plan. I'll show you right now what those are. On page SP2. There is the addition of a walkway. There was concern of a walking path from the street, Meadowside Road, to uh, the entrance of the building. So that was established here as a minimum of four feet wide from, from the front property line and adjacent to the front of the buildings and wrapping around to the last building at the end. Um, there's also still 24 feet of, of uh, driveway space in between the end of the parking uh, aisle and the uh, sidewalk so that cars can actually uh, have, two, have enough space for two-way traffic and also have that 90 degree turning radius that they need to get into the parking stalls. Uh, the other addition are uh, privacy fence on the side property line. So we have a six foot privacy fence on the uh, easterly side and also on the westerly side of the property. And the other two changes were on the uh, next sheet, SP3. What we did here was we added uh, a curtain drain around the foundations of all the buildings um, all the way um, around the back and the sides of the buildings so that there's uh, and also there's enough pitch to get it from the back here all the way down and tie it into the front overflow line for the drainage system. Um, this will accommodate um, some groundwater flows so that it basically takes that water and routes it um, to the uh, to the overflow line as opposed to letting the groundwater flows <coughs> off to the property line. And uh, the other, the last uh, modification was to this trench drain. This trench drain is still this, in the same location, still the same length around the rear and side property lines. Um, the addition, the uh, modification rather, was to the construction of it, which is there's concern of uh, this being a subgrade uh, infiltration trench where the stone is underground. Um, so uh, there was a, there was a, uh, comment that uh, it was if the stone on of the trench was exposed at grade um, it would help better with the uh, uh, surface flows of stormwater so we went ahead and modified that so that our detail their construction detail on page sp6 shows uh, the stone at grade so that therefore it's not basically buried with uh, with uh, topsoil so that would be exposed around the rear and side property lines. And those were the uh, four modifications. And I'll turn it right back over to Attorney Lynch. So I want to stress some of the points that I made to you <clears throat> during the course of our initial uh, uh, application to you. Uh, first of all, these uh, amendments that were made to the site plan, uh, they meet the burden of the statute, which says that uh, the board is bound to approve these applications unless there's a <clears throat> compelling health or safety reason that overrides the uh, state-mandated public policy to encourage affordable housing in a municipality. All of these plans were reviewed by city departments. They received approval from the fire department the sewer commission, the police commission. We came in with, a <clears throat> in with our own traffic expert who corroborated that the traffic that would be emanating from this site would have no adverse impact on Meadowside Road, and then this board saw fit to have a third party review made as well. So that, uh, that third party review uh, corroborated all of the findings of our traffic expert. There was one comment that he made in his report uh, saying that it would be preferable if there was a wider area in the driveway for delivery trucks to be able to turn around. And again, we addressed that by <clears throat> amending the site plan with the presentation that was just given to you by uh, uh, Washington. Uh, the statute talks about a condition that affects the viability of a project. And I submit to you that any real estate project has economic considerations to it. There's the land costs, there's the construction costs of the building, 
there's the maintenance of the property, there's the property management, and there's the taxes. And any developer is entitled to develop a piece of property in accordance with the law and expect a reasonable profit in that endeavor. And I submit to you that the removal of the last building on this project to the rear reduces the rental income on the property by 25%. And we believe <clears throat> that that is clearly an adverse impact on the viability of the project. I think that all of the standards other than that have been met by the uh, presentation to you. I think that uh, you know, what we've done here is to try to address three of the four concerns that you raised. But I have to say to you very honestly that if an appeal is taken of this, I think that it is an a indefensible position that the city's in, and we're looking to reach a compromise here so the city attorney's office isn't burdened with another case that they can't win. So I'm being blunt with you, but I'm also being honest that we have addressed your concerns, and uh, reducing the size of this project by three units does affect the viability of the project. It's a low-impact project to the neighborhood. It's located right next door to a 70, it's located right next door to a 70 unit condominium complex where most of the comments in objection came from persons who live in a multifamily development themselves. So uh, I'd ask that you approve this with the resubmitted plans. Uh, it's being submitted to you in accordance with the provisions of the statute and unfortunately, we would have to take an appeal uh, if this request is not granted. So with that, any questions you may have, we'd be happy to entertain them. <clears throat> Are there any questions for Attorney Lynch? Good evening, Attorney Lynch. Um, time frame. Uh, we have several new members of the board. Uh, and the question is, is your client willing to waive the 65-day time frame for us to be able to assimilate the information that you ask? I'd be happy to. And I'd how long would you be willing to waive that for? Well, I did count the days. Uh, I submitted. I can do that really quick. The statute provides for a 15-day period to either appeal or file for the resubmission. So I gave David a letter that was stamped into the zoning office <clears throat> on January 10th, I believe. So 65 days from January 10th, this board has to uh, render a decision. So if you feel that this is something that's uh, gonna go beyond your next meeting uh, into uh, March, I would say a 30-day uh, extension would be agreeable. Second question I had for you, um, the date of the effective Board decision was what, please? I believe it was the 19th of uh, December. My letter to David re references that the <coughs> zoning board approved this on December 19th. And then you had 15 days, 15 business Actually, days? Actually, I have a copy that Meg sent me of the legal notice that went into the paper. And again, I, I stand by that. It was uh, approved by the, uh, by the board on uh, Tuesday, December 19th. So you had 15 business days from that date to file an appeal or to ask the board to reconsider. Is that your position? No, it's 15 days from the posting of the notice in the newspaper, and the notice went into the <coughs> uh, Milford Mirror, I believe, Meg, 20th of December. Is that correct? Uh, I don't know. I don't think it ran the 20th. Typically, it's a week from the Thursday after the meeting whatever that calendar date is. We counted the days out, so my January 10th letter was w within the, the time frame. The 15 days, Bob, runs from the date that the notice of the board's decision runs in the newspaper. It was uh, published in the Milford Mirror on December 28th. There you go. Any further questions? Okay, I would open this up to uh, public comment. Um, if you are for this uh, proposal, please come to speak first. Anyone in favor? Okay, next would be anyone against. I would ask that you state your name and address and uh, speak into the microphone and address the commission only. And please keep your comments to about three minutes. Thank you. 
Christopher Shetziat Warner. You put that up? Yes, thank you very much. Christopher Shetziat Warner. I live in 308 Meadowside, Unit 304, looking directly onto the property. I happen to be absent when this was first uh, uh, decided uh, that this would go through. Uh, it directly affects us. Uh, it, it's basically a paradigm change. And as far as I'm concerned, they could just as well build a skyscraper there. I'm against this. Uh, and there's a whole uh, team of people who are similarly affected, particularly building 308. I, vote ag I would ask you to consider uh, not, uh, how do you say it, not, uh, not extending any further use uh, as to what you've already granted. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak in opposition? Uh, James Lambert, 18 Great Meadow Drive, Milford. I live in the single dwelling house um, uh, right behind the property. Uh, what I would like to see ultimately is, you know, obviously they have to make money to build. I'm okay with that. But, you know, what I was looking at was putting four units into the, into the building instead of three, so there's only three buildings. So that would be my comment. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Could you please uh, keep comments to the board and not address other uh, people at the, at the meeting? Thank you. Donna Tevlin, 300 Meadowside Road, Unit 309. Mr. Chairman, at the last meeting, you were very wonderful with us. You expressed all of our concerns and the concern of the fourth building. I'm hoping that the board agrees with you again and does not let them have the fourth building. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm Susan Glennon, 99 Carlson Drive. Um, I just want to reiterate what I stated last month during the public hearing, that your purview for this project is the health and safety um, issues, not the financial viability for the developer. Your traffic expert who was hired by the board for the prior application expressed a safety concern over the absence of a vehicle turnaround area, to which someone from the applicant's own team responded that in order to create a cul-de-sac, which I think was the term used, they'd have to eliminate a building. So I don't see that anything really has changed in this modification that would alter that concern from your traffic expert. Um, I'm assuming that from uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Sadi said that your, all the information from the prior application carries forward for you to consider. If not, I would suggest that you make sure your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed and you potentially, um, you know, if you need to bring the traffic expert back, you do so. Um, you know, taken right from your own uh, City of Milford website, your concern is to ensure the safety and health, safety and welfare of the community by enhancing and protecting Milford's quality of life. Um, certainly, reasonable profit is subjective. Um, you know, a builder can purchase a house like this and renovate it and resell it and still make a profit. Um, I, I don't uh, feel that that should be your concern. I think the safety concern should prevail over financial viability. Um, in terms of comments that the police department has signed off on this, you know, the police department have on more than one occasion, and it's in, it's in minutes, that um, indicated that they don't have the manpower to really look in great depth at these applications, and I've always felt that they pretty much just sign off on them unless there's something blatant um, that, is, uh, that, they, that they find. Um, I, I would ask the chair, if you're telling us that we have to be polite and speak only to you, that you ask the applicants to do the same and be um, a little bit respectful of the people that are up here talking. The same thing happened last month uh, in December where um, there were comments being made while people were, were talking and that's just um, really not acceptable. Um, so again, I'm going to ask um, 
that you uphold the decision of the prior board, that that rear built building be removed um, and reducing the number of units to nine. I know that um, I think there were five of you on the board at the time um, that, that are here now that are, were on the board at the time that voted um, in favor of that modification. And um, I hope you'll continue to be independent thinkers. And um, I really have, don't see anything that would cause you to change your mind. And I hope some of the other board members will follow suit and agree with them. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Uh, Attorney Lynch. Yes, I'd just like to, again, <clears throat> stress the fact that uh, we are not emphasizing the economic element. We are just stating a fact, and it appears in the statute, and it's something that the statute, the legislature actually uh, uh, anticipated in terms of talking about denials of projects or approvals of projects with conditions that affect the viability of the development. So exactly what I'm bringing out here was anticipated when the uh, legislation was drafted. <clears throat> but I'm also stressing the fact that these applications have to be approved unless there's an overriding public health or safety element and the record is clear with the approval of the project by all the city departments and the sign off of your uh, own independent traffic uh, uh, expert who reviewed this, this application meets all of those standards. Thank you. Uh, now the general public's allowed to address anything that Attorney Lynch just said. If anyone would like to come up. Seeing none. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Good evening. Adrienne Duramo, 308 Meadowside Road, Unit 103. Um, we had been here in, uh, previously and discussed some of the hardships that would incur uh, from having this building right next door to our building. Uh, in terms of resale, when I try to resell my unit, when I have a building six feet away from my unit, that's a concern. I'm, I want this builder to make money, but I don't want to lose money. The last project that went up may have affected the value of my home. My taxes were reduced. I was very ha happy about that, but also the value of my house was reduced. Within the time that those other units were built on Meadowside Road, and I believe they directly affected the value of my property. Now another group of units is coming right next door to me, and I made a big investment in that unit. And I knew that I lived in a 72 unit area, but I didn't expect extra units being built next door. There was a one family house there, and now they want to put 12 families there. I don't think it's fair, and I don't think we should suffer the hardship. Thank you for listening. Anyone else? Attorney Lynch, last word. Okay, um, is there any reason why we should uh, keep the public hearing open? Okay, seeing none, we will close the public hearing. Um, staff, do you have any comment? Uh, just a reminder to the board that the uh, issue before you tonight uh, is uh, uh, the conditions. It's not the overall project. Uh, the board approved that. So it was uh, when you deliberate whatever your discussions you have on this, the decisions you make, it's based on uh, what was presented to you uh, this evening by the applicant. Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. Um, you know, we did deliberate quite a bit and had a lot of discussion and heard a lot of testimony from, uh, from the public um, earlier on, and we did come up with a, what we felt was a viable solution and viability seems to be the sort of the reason that uh, the applicant's coming back. And you know, it is it is less less in income. That's for sure. That's that's easy math. Um, it's also less construction cost. Um, if you were to buy a piece of property that w was zoned for 12 or nine units um, in the city of Milford, and it was not a an 830G application 
you'd probably pay a lot more per square foot than you would um, when you were buying a single family house with a big backyard. Um, so I think, in, in my mind, it's, it's, still, it's still a home run, maybe not a grand slam, but I think there's money to be made at nine units, and I would um, advocate that we stick uh, to what we already approved, but um, I'll leave it up to the board to uh, make a motion and have discussion. We have a motion. Question for Attorney Lynch. Um, no, the, 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 the hearing is closed. Sorry. All right. Then I'll make a motion. Um, make the mo um, motion to approve the project with the stipulation that the all uh, all four buildings would be constructed. However, uh, we would approve the project with uh, two additional affordable units to be added to the project. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Can, can that be clarified? Uh, I, I, didn't um, well, I, I understand what Mr. Grant uh, is asking for. Uh, but there was a, uh, if you recall, previously uh, we learned that we cannot uh, compel an applicant to provide more than the minimum uh, requirement of the statute. Now, David, does that um, hold true with only a uh, first application when they've come back uh, for a second bite at the apple? Does that not open up all negotiations? No, it's the same statute. It's the same statute. So, Mr. Grant, would you like to uh, I, revise your can motion? I make a point of order? I know the public sure. hearing is closed. In, just in terms of a vote. Can you just begin with the mic for me? I think that if a motion is made along the lines that Mr. Grant just talked of, or was starting to talk of, and it was approved, then it would be thrown into the court of the applicant to either accept the first approval accept the second approval or take an appeal of the first approval. So I just wanted to make that clear that if, even though, even so, though. So your position is that it is almost a negotiation where you would, you would accept to consider anyway uh, a, a motion that was approved with additional um, affordable units. Correct, because what happened with the Grillo application is that's what you did and we didn't accept it. So you can take whatever vote you want to take, and we can either accept it or not accept it. Right. David's point is that it's not, it's not a legitimate, uh, that we don't have the right to, to do that, or we don't have the ability to do that. Is, is that correct? My understanding was you, you can't impose it as a condition well, initially. And that's what uh, that's what I was told by our our council. So if right. So now we're in a different world because we're now with a second bite at the apple in a sense. Like Mr. Lynch said, you can you can ask. Um, they don't have to agree to it, right. and it, they could just say, "Well, you know, that's not allowed by statute." So. Okay. So, Mr. Grant, do you want to just reiterate uh, for clarification the intent of your motion? motion is to approve the project with uh, two additional affordable units. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? We do not. So do we have another motion? Mr. Sadi. Mr. Quish, I make a motion to approve the revisions of the December 19th as stated, Mr. Grant's motion of December 19th. I'm sorry, Mr. Quish's motion of December 19th of 2017. So my understanding is you're making a motion to uphold the motion that was passed at our previous meeting. Is that correct? Correct. Do we have a second? I'll second that.
So for clarification, uh, there's a motion and a second, which effectively lets the decision made at our last meeting stand. Does everyone understand that? Well, let's call the roll. Mr. Kalichin. Against the motion. Ms. Austin. Against the motion. Mr. Grant. Against the motion. Mr. Moore. Against the motion. Mr. Marlowe. With the motion. Mr. Penzella. Against the motion. Ms. Dusat Janice. With the motion. Mr. Sadi. With the motion. Ms. Kearney. Mr. Quish. With the motion. Uh, the motion failed. So we have um, an open floor. We need another motion. Seeing none. Can I make another point of order, please? Not to interrupt. No. But I had a discussion with Mr. Selkis prior to tonight's hearing relative to Ms. Doset Janice participating in the vote of here tonight. She is a statutorily aggrieved party because she Okay, owns you know what? We're not going to entertain that now. Thank you very much for your. That's not. We're not going to hear that from you tonight. It's her choice to recuse herself or not. Thank you for your input. But you understand that that would be grounds for an appeal. Well, that's today. fine. That's okay. fine. So thank right. you for as your input. You understand Just that. that's all. Thank you for your right. input. It's her choice. Okay, we have a motion from Mr. Moore. I make a motion to approve the um, plans as presented this evening. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any further discussion? I have a question. I'd like to. So, the um, can I ask a question about the sure. plans? Sure. Okay. So the previous um, board had made uh, there were concerns about safety about the turnaround. Were those adequately addressed in this, to our satisfaction? Not to my satisfaction, but um, obviously the applicant thinks that they made adjustments that were sufficient. So the turnaround was the only item that was brought up, though, as a safety, as a safety issue. Correct. My 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 concern is, as everyone knows, I I do live at 331 Meadowside, so um, my concern is to make sure that if we if we do decide to pass this as presented, that the neighbors have the adequate um, fencing and lighting, I mean, protections against um, any disruption that this project is going to cost them. So that's really my main concern, um, knowing, as Mr. Sulk has said, that um, if this goes to appeal, that it will probably go back to the original project. So um, that's my concern. Can we talk about whether that's been adequately addressed before we vote? The, um, the fencing is new uh, and is what was asked for in the last meeting. Um, drainage was addressed which I believe was uh, satisfactory, satisfactory to my mind anyway. Um, the turnaround radius of a cul-de-sac would not be uh, adequately concerned by this new uh, proposal. And I think there lies the health and safety issue. So I would not support this motion, but there is a motion and a second on board. We can discuss it more and eventually vote on it. Anyone else has a comment? Mr. Sadi. Thank you very much, Mr. Quish. I just want to put on the record that I've had an occasion to review the, uh, uh, the MGAT uh, broadcast of the December 19th meeting. I've had an occasion to review the minutes of the meeting before my previous vote and my vote that will come. Thank you. I'm sorry, I did not understand you. Could you say that again into the mic? I've had an occasion to review, although not a member of the board, in December of 2017, I had an occasion to review the MGAT video of the hearing in total, including the votes were taken, the arguments. I had an occasion to review the minutes of the particular meeting, December 19th, and also the actions taken. All right, thank you. Any other comments or questions? We have a motion and a second to approve as submitted tonight. Call the roll. Mr. Kalichin. I'm with the motion. Ms. Austin. With the motion. Mr. Grant. 
against the motion. Mr. Moore. With the motion. Mr. Marlowe. Against the motion. Mr. Pinzella. With the motion. Mr. Sechenese. Against the motion. Mr. Sadi. Against the motion. Ms. Kearney. Mr. Quish. Against the motion. Uh, Mr. Grant, you voted against the motion? Correct. Uh, in that case, uh, it's a tie vote and the motion fails. So, uh, some guidance, uh, Mr. Sulkis, we, do we need another motion or is a failed motion uh, sufficient for us to close this tonight and move on to the next order of business? You had a motion, it failed. So from the applicant standpoint, um, you're keeping things uh, as they are. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, next order of business. Next order of business is 804 Boston Post Road, zone CDD1, petition of Ray Oliver, architect, for special permit with amendment to the site plan for an accessory structure on map 77, block 828, parcel one, of which NYM Milford LLC is the owner. Good evening, board and chairman. My name is Ray Oliver, with an architect with offices at 3 Lafayette Street, Milford. I'm here representing New York Mart LLC. Uh, as you probably know, they're the uh, owner of the building on 804 Boston Post Road, the former M&M Farms building, and they're renovating that, converting it to an Asian market and a food court. We're here tonight as for an amendment to our special permit and to the site plan to add a, an accessory structure. On the corner of the property, on the uh, west, northwest corner of the property, there's, we were going to put a sign. The original sign was 25 feet high this is an ordinary ground sign for this zone, 25 feet high and 12 feet wide. That's going to be replaced by a new structure which comes from China. It's called a Paifang. You have a, two little exhibits in your packet. One that is a color rendering and the other is a dimensional drawing of that structure. What it, what doesn't show in the drawings is that that structure is made out of solid granite that's been carved with traditional uh, Chinese figures. The, the top of the structure would be, the, would be clay tiles to match what's going on in the building itself. So this will be kind of a landmark building. It's a gateway that's used between sectors of a city ordinarily but this is really gonna be a landmark for Milford. There's one of these structures that is an entrance to the uh, Chinatown in Boston, and it's, it's quite a sight. Uh, in order to put this where, where we've got it, we've had to move it back from the street. The sign was only 10 feet back. Because this is an accessory structure, it has to move 20 feet back. But what that will do will give us an opportunity to have a little sort of eating area, courtyard with, with a table and some benches so people that are getting their the Asian foods, they can, during the summertime, they can come out and sit and eat and enjoy it there. Um, the downside of, of putting the, the structure where it is is that we're gonna lose two parking spaces. But I think the loss of those parking spaces is more than offset by the uh, by the fun character of the structure, the landmark uh, quality of it, and the ability for people to enjoy the little eating area out in front of it. 
Uh, that's really the only change to the to our project as it is. They're working towards completion of the project. The asphalt plants will open in April, and they'll be able to redo the the parking lot and all of the the walkways around the building. Um, so that's pretty much it. If anybody has any questions, uh, Kevin Yu is here. Feng Lee is here. Um, both are involved in the project. So we hope you approve it, and Milford will be on the uh, map. Thank you. Any questions from members of the board? Scott. Uh, um, good evening, Mr. Oliver. Um, I know that when this was originally approved, that parking was an issue, and Correct. I think we made an exception on this, if I'm not mistaken, and the thought of losing a couple more spaces. I, I'm sure you've looked at it, but is there anywhere on that lot that those spaces can be replaced? Not on the lot, but in the meantime, the owner has purchased the not the property adjacent to the building, but the next one down so that they definitely have parking for uh, employees that work on that site. So they've been able to address that issue with that. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, Mr. Zolkas. Uh My one uh, question is on the uh, property they just purchased, um, uh, how many parking spaces uh, how many employees can they accommodate on that site? And w what, if anything, is on that site now? That's a single family house at the moment. Um, we haven't laid out any parking lot or anything. It is in a commercial zone, so we could come back with a layout for a number of spaces. It's, I would guess that it's on the order of 14 spaces. Other questions? Okay, this is a public hearing. Would anyone like to speak uh, to this matter? Seeing none, does any, anyone see a reason why we shouldn't close the public hearing? Okay, we'll close the public hearing um, and uh, entertain a motion. I'd make a motion to approve the project at 804 Boston Post Road. Mr. Moore with a second. Um, any discussion? I'd just like to say one thing. Um, you know, I was a, a big uh, supporter of this project early on. I think it's going to be a great thing. I would encourage the owners to um, try to get that plywood fence down as soon as possible. It kind of is an eyesore, and we're looking forward to seeing what the, uh, the building's going to look like. But uh, with a little bit of site cleaning, um, I imagine most of the work is inside now. Um, but that would be... Uh, that would be a great improvement to the corner there. And uh, well, I personally wish you well, and I think it's going to be a great addition to the city. Any other questions or comments on that motion? Okay, call the roll. Mr. Kalichin? I'm with the motion. Ms. Austin? With the motion. Mr. Grant? With the motion. Mr. Moore? With the motion. Mr. Marlowe? Oh, with the motion. Mr. Pensala. With the motion. Ms. Doucette Janice. With the motion. Mr. Sadi. With the motion. Ms. Kearney. With the motion. Mr. Quish. With the motion. Thank you very much. We'll do our, be do our best. <laughs> Next order of business is... Um, Is subcommittee appointments. Has everyone had a minute to check out the uh, subcommittees? So I would, I would actually um, like to make uh, one point. Uh, there was a question here about uh, the rules subcommittee as being um, a uh, a standing committee. Uh, we are going to keep that open, and we'll keep it open for the purpose of general housekeeping on uh, language issues, um, also for, um, for committee members and board members' input to see if we feel we can uh, improve clarity or uh, drive direction uh, for the future. So we will keep that open. 
Um, but um, I would actually, you know, take anybody's, um, if there's any committee that someone would like to be on, please just let me know. I don't, I don't know how we've done this in the past. But just sort of raise your hand and say which committee you'd like to be on or, or liaison. Or do we should we take it one at a time to make it easier for everybody? Um, okay, so let's uh, let's do this then. We'll take uh, the, uh, the uh, official liaison to the Board of Aldermen. Is there anybody here who would like to take that on? <clears throat> I'm sorry, I must not have spoken clearly enough. <laughs> Well, we, we, I mean, we could give this a little bit more thought. We just got this in the mail um, or the email this past, uh, past week. So, let, you know, I would say then let's, uh, let's take this up at the next meeting, put it on the agenda, please. And hopefully people will give some thought to the various, uh, various opportunities. Um, and um, I am definitely open to having unofficial liaise to any, any other committee in the government, and I'm sure that uh, if anyone has an interest in that, we can make a case sufficient uh, to that board or committee to allow us to uh, participate in, in observatory fashion. So anyway, we'll put, kick this down the road, one more meeting. And I'd just like to add, uh, if anybody's interested in the uh, subcommittee on the regulations, uh, we'll have a meeting next month the 6th at 6.30 here. Okay, so uh, approval of the minutes. Do we have a motion? Uh, Make a motion to approve the minutes. Again, this is uh, j the January 16th meeting minutes. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second. second. We have a second and a, a motion and a second. All in favor? Any opposed? Um, staff report? Uh, none this evening. All right, thank you. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Let's do it. Thank you all. We really have looked at it broadly to make sure there is something for different types of cities and towns in Connecticut, that there are actions that an urban community can take on and be successful in, as well as a rural community. So we have